Hey folks, it's the Unsung Podcast. I am Mark. I'm joined by Professor Chris Classes again. I got a promotion. Yeah. Yes. He's getting promoted. He's Side D, the, the home straight of our in depth look at Turbo Folk. A card, right? You may get a monocle. Fucking hell, man. And a cane. <laughs> a cane. <laughs> a, what, and a pocket top watch. <laughs> pocket watch, yes. <laughs> Goodness me, I'll be a Dickensian gentleman in no time. <laughs> um, yeah, so if you've been in this journey with us, you'll know that we ha- this has been a bit of an exhaustive study of the phenomenon of turbo folk. We did not, and I repeat, we did not want to just sort of ogle this 90s grotesquery. We wanted to know where it came from, how did it get there, what was happening in that country when this bizarre kind of music became the dominant art form for the best part of a decade. And let's we forget, the dominant art form that was openly advocating for fucking babies to get thrown in rivers and mosques to be burned and just acts of unbelievable savagery. So... Uh, thanks for coming with us. This is the final part. We ended Side C on a fairly hopeful note because it, it, we, were, we were learning about how a lot of the downfall of Milosevic and a lot of the kind of cultural renewal really came from student movements, a, a movement called Oppo in particular, and the ways that they adapted to succeed within that sort of state police framework and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's kind of brought us up to now. Um, where is Turbo Folk these days? And the answer is actually surprising, given if you heard the lyrics we were quoting <laughs> not so long ago, because it's big. I mean, back in, we, we, we mentioned this earlier on, but back in 2011, the Tuborg Ultimate Summer Festival went ahead in Belgrade, and that was Moby and Amy Winehouse. And that was head to head with a Turbo Folk Festival in the same city, not even far away, on the same day. And that both events did really, really well, which shows you that Turbo Folk is still in fairly rude health Mm -hmm. in in modern history. Vice, you know, out there looking for gun-wielding paramilitaries and genocidal lyrics and contemporary Turbo Folk, they're probably going to be sorely disappointed. The gradual normalisation of Turbo Folk uh, and its distancing itself from the overt ethno-nationalism has actually brought other elements to the fore. Those include... Distinct aesthetics is a polite way of putting it. I have a lump like that. And the prominence of LGBTQ themes. The writer Elizabeth Tabor, again on that Scalar website um, that we'll link, she says, Despite the authoritarian impetus of Turbo Folk, the genre has a much less stifled socio political environment in which to grow into a more inclusive and progressive art form. I mean, it, it's safe to say it has recovered from its lowest ebb immediately after Milosevic lost power because at that time, the genre's stars fell out of favour. They were kind of shunned by the media that had championed them. Uh, I mean, Milosevic's wife, for example, Pink TV, all that stuff, didn't have the same influence. Uh, the, the entire... Still hugely influential, just owned by somebody else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, the, the entire uh, art form, in inverted commas, was being scrutinised for its role as well. It has since returned to high profile status and considerable success um, the Zvedze Granda show is a variation of the pop idol format that relies heavily on turbo folk and that's on TV several times a week and has broken multiple ratings records uh, turbo folk as we mentioned has been heavily criticised for its portrayal of gender roles in particular however it's grown pretty far from its anti-feminist roots in the Milosevic regime because again let's be clear Traditional gender roles are a big part of authoritarian regimes everywhere and it's now become a much more inclusive and progressive genre for women and the queer community. Uh, Again, Elizabeth Tabor uh, observes that many of the typical rigid gender roles from earlier turbo folk were reflective of the paternalistic culture of the region. For the genre to become popular, to get a broad audience to listen, especially in the rural and conservative communities, it had to kind of subscribe to those uh, standards and fit those ideals you know the patriarchal structure of particularly Serbian society was crucial to their national identity quote attractive sparkly women were used to influence people by being role models for women and status symbols for the men who attained them and I say attained them with extra quotation marks 
Marina Grudic uh, of Belgrade and Sarajevo University, she's an expert in gender studies and she observes uh, when Turbofolk was introduced, it altered and emphasised what the standard of what a respectable woman is. The women who came to be celebrities within the genre are emblematic of the ideology behind Turbofolk itself. For instance, Tsecha became a wildly popular singer during the 90s and was heavily involved in Turbofolk's development and popular performance. Her public image is calculated so as to establish her as a prominent representative of the Serbian community. Images of her body and powerful images of gender abuses in her videos are interconnected with the overall tendencies of politicisation of gender hierarchies in Serbian society. To simplify that a wee bit, Mark, you mentioned this earlier, there's some highly problematic images mm-hmm. in Setsa's videos. Some very misogynistic stuff, some very self-objectifying stuff, stuff that would not pass the grade for most people who consider themselves feminist. Whilst there is a display of a powerful woman, uh, again, regarding Setsa, she is powerful only within a traditional fem- feminine role. She maintains her status of respectability by outwardly being monogamously devoted to a man and her family. And that's a narrative that Setsa has really tried to reinforce post Arkan. Yeah, she's killed. not not remarried. She's never really linked with other men, you know. She's yeah, still she, devoted to that one guy who's been dead for over 20 years. It's crucial to her survival, though. You know, whether or not she's even sincere about her devotion to Arkan, she has to stick with it because her audience, her status, her entire brand is dependent on maintaining that. I mean, even, you know, in terms of her hiding from the allegations of complicity behind her just being a dutiful wife, that kind of further reinforces her identity in their minds. I mean, in fairness, Turbo Folk's not the only genre that was native to that region of the world that's felt anachronistic. There's a, there's a genre called Sevdalinka, which is kind of part of the Ottoman legacy in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, it's a folk tradition with lots of Arabian influences that would maybe differentiate it from the other uh, music in the other areas. but it has similar tussles in terms of pushback against attempts to modernise its stance on gender, on diversity. You know, it's very set in the past and it's very unwilling to reckon with a lot of that. But Turbo Folk became so astronomically huge that it's a far more compelling thing to, to, to examine. With time, Turbo Folk is definitely evolving away from the roots of the Milosevic regime. regime. Uh, we spoke earlier on about Helena Karliusha. She's one of the major figureheads and is far more modern, queer friendly, that kind of thing. So we should look at Turbo Folk, gender, the LGBTQ community. Maybe a place to start. And a telling fact is to, to to be clear that most pop stars in the genre do not outright identify as gay, lesbian or queer themselves. But a lot of contemporary turbo folk subverts heteronormative values and is queer and superficially feminist in its nature and in its messaging. It's interesting that Serbia in particular has a lot of residual aspects of hyper-masculinity especially amongst the kind of people that were very pro-war, you mm-hmm. know. Um, that stance, I think, this is my take, is culturally consistent with that Serbian closeness to Russia because Serbia is very close to Russia, the Cyrillic, uh, a lot of the politics, the kind of more left-wing slant, and we know the Russian attitudes to LGBTQ communities, and I think a lot of that carries over into Serbia. But by these figures not being gay, but simply adopting and promoting aspects of the culture. I think the artists walk a fine line in maintaining their audiences. They can sort of satisfy the more modern Western looking audiences, the more pro LGBTQ audiences, but they can sort of get away with it with their kind of slightly more old school, traditional conservative audiences. The use of hyper feminized figures is really dovetailed with 
long-standing aspects of drag culture as well. You know, a, a lot of the West's typical gay icons, Madonna, Kylie Minogue, Cher, Dolly Parton, you know, hyper-feminised Dolly Parton, that kind of thing. It lends itself quite well to, to drag culture, to, to queer culture and the hyper-feminised nature of, I mean, there's a, a lot of plastic surgery going on and it's it's kitschy. Yeah. In the track uh, Groova Groova by, uh, bear with me here, Mia Borisavljevic, Borisavljevic, God, no, Borisavljevic, I think. <laughs> They're a scantily dressed women, but the men wear even less clothing and are depicted in more servile positions than the women. So I think it kind of does... Change days. Yeah, it does well. It's sort of sexualising the male body more even than the female body and disrupting that power dynamic. So I think that starts to lean towards this sort of third wave feminist narrative. Um, Boki 13's live performance of a track called Nebrinis is another example of kind of queer turbo folk. The singer dresses half as a woman and half as a man, kind of playing with it a bit. There's a blogger called Eurovicious uh, who, who writes for The Balkanist, it's a, it's a website, a good one, who says, uh, quote, Who'd have thunk that the country we superficially associate with nationalist warmongering, corruption and NATO airstrikes would have quite possibly the world's gayest pop music? <laughs> Amazingly, I'm not talking about the sort of faux lesbian antics designed to titillate straight guys that are the bane of Western pop culture. Serbian music videos feature just as many scantily clad men as women, if not more. Kind of an interesting reflection. Yeah. The origins. Yes. You get something like that for Eurodance, don't you? Yeah, you do. Yeah. The crossover with Eurovision and mm. all that kind of camp yep. culture as well, yeah. So the optimism, though, around Turbo Folk is not universal. So opinions on it are still somewhat divided, both within and out with Serbia. Liberal groups see it as somewhere between a grim reminder of the atrocities that took place during the wars and an ongoing form of propaganda that continues to glorify those deeds, whilst maybe even potentially helping to radicalise a new generation. I mean, these songs, that the, the, the hideous lyrics we quoted earlier, are still getting millions of hits. They are there. They are fetishised. They just are. They're taboo as well. And that leads a lot of young folk to go and listen to them in the same way as you go and check out the most extreme movies, you go and check out the most extreme metal. Taboo stuff brings young people to the table. I think it's interesting that, for example, Serbia won the Eurovision Song Contest in 2007, but the, the track itself made absolutely no allusions to the prevailing turbo folk tradition that was all over the charts at the time. And I think some people can interpret that, uh, you know, it's it's a Euro-facing Serbia trying to hide aspects of its culture. Like, is it a little bit embarrassed about some of the Turbo Folk stuff? Maybe they're reading too much into it, but it's it's worth considering. An academic, uh, Isaac Chikyang Tang, writes in a thing called Echoes of a Turbulent Past that perhaps the most concerning aspect about Turbo Folk is its continued popularity in Serbia. You know, wartime leaders and soldiers, as well as the nationalistic sentiments, remain extremely popular, perpetuating pervasive divisions and ongoing hatred. And it is suggested that Turbo Folk's lingering appeal might, in part, Certainly not in whole, or not even in main, but in part be a sign that some Serbs do not support the political direction their country took since Milosevic left office. That some of the remaining the residual fan base for that may be partly because of that period 
and, and what the genre represented. And even though it's drifted far from that, they still feel enough of a connection to it to, to want to continue to support it. Oh, I remember reading around about um, when I was doing the research about Turbo Folk and there was that, I think I made the comment in the first episode about how it was really popular in, in Croatia. Uh-huh. There's a few articles by writers from, from various music blogs in Croatia. I read one of them uh, talking about how, well, this is just music for kids now and it's not really, like people who aren't serious minded about music just don't really care about this. You know, so there's all, but yeah. it's a pop argument. It's like, well, it's not really for you. I think it's probably quite difficult to disentangle what would be Serbian pop music from Turbo Folk because they share a lot of the same sound and a lot of the same production values and because of Western culture, a lot of the same aesthetic. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting though because we found a multitude of Turbo Folk playlists who <laughs> made their own, actually. Um, but in some of them, there is no distinction made between the eras, you know? So you have the benign, even progressive LGBTQ positive sort of stuff alongside <laughs> some of the absolute fucking madness mm-hmm. from 1993. And that, a bit like the black metal argument, the the proximity thing has the potential to sort of gateway drug. There's also a lot of playlists that were just full of 90s stuff, which is weird, but I find it, I've, I would find it quite difficult The people who, who do not like the direction the country's taken are still listening to turbo folk music as a way of ad- identifying with the past when the turbo folk music that is out there is probably just noise to them given yeah. their age. Yeah, it will be so different, won't yeah. it? Mm-hmm. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites according to a recent Indeed survey. With Indeed, everything hiring is all in one place and it makes it so easy. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences each each day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. The more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join the more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash podcast. Just go to Indeed.com slash podcast right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Terms and conditions apply. Indeed.com slash podcast. Need to hire? You need Indeed. So I guess that all being said, what's next? I mean, after all, at the end of 2023, this group called the New Lines Institute in Washington wrote, it has been 28 years since the Dayton Accords were signed and the Western Balkans are inching closer than ever to a return to the political violence, ethnic cleansing and mass migration that plagued the region following the dissolution of the Yugoslav Federation. Al Jazeera also reported late last year An escalation into a conflict in the Western Balkans was averted, but the likelihood of future flare-ups remains high. On September 24th, armed Serb paramilitaries ambushed a police patrol near the village of Banska in the northern part of Kosovo, killing one police officer. And we should remember that the spark that lit the Kosovo war was the killing of a police officer. These sort of things are very, very significant. And Al Jazeera goes on there. Uh, the gunmen then fled to a monastery near the Kosovo-Serbia border where police forces engaged with them in a firefight. Three armed Serbs were killed. The rest were either arrested or fled. It's one of the worst episodes of violence in the country since the end of the Kosovo War in 1999. Mm-hmm. That's in 2023. Tensions are high. A big part of that, by the way, is also thanks to Russia. Russia has very close ties to Serbia. We spoke about their shared animosity towards NATO over the bombing of Belgrade uh, during the Kosovo War. Russia is desperate to detract attention from Ukraine, desperate to create any other sort of conflict that might draw military force, media attention, money, anything to it and away from what they're trying to do in Ukraine. And so stoking the flames of, or let's say, the ashes or the, the smouldering ashes of ethnic tensions mm-hmm. uh, in Serbia in particular. Yeah. It's very high in their agenda. It's very advantageous to them if conflict erupts in the Balkans right now. Yeah. There's also the post-Soviet East just general slide towards authoritarian leaders as well. You yeah. know, we've seen it in Hungary. Hungary. 
Um, we've seen it in Belarus. Yeah, yeah, we've seen it in Slovenian guys. Obviously, it's pretty or Slovakian. Slovakian, Slovakian yeah, guys. Yeah, he's yeah. pretty, pretty tasty. So I think there's probably for some people, a lot of people, I imagine out there, feel as though their great liberal project, their great liberal project, has failed, and we need to go back to someone that's got a strong, a strong hand. We've certainly seen yeah, lots of elements of that in America, and they've never really had that kind of strong willed leader in the way that. They think they want it now yeah. with Donald Trump, you know. So I think there's definitely a, a feeling that, like I said, the great liberal project has failed. The end of history is now over. You know, it's now we're now back to history. <laughs> yeah, that that is that is actually the remarkable bit because I think Fukuyama was largely blown out of the water by the Balkans mm. and what happened there. The notion that history was done. Um, so I mean, let's conclude, Mark, on a, a, a cheery note. Serbian nationalist music in 2024. <laughs> <laughs> what I mean, maybe Turbo Folk won't fan the flames of a future conflict, right? Hopefully, there won't be a future conflict, but if there is, in the internet age, maybe a newer genre will step into that void, or maybe not. Maybe the old Turbo Folk uniform will get fished out the cupboard and dusted down. Well, there is an increase in the kind of music that, of like rap music and, and trap and all that, you know, which are growing in. in popularity yeah well actually yeah. new east archive it's, it's, it's a pretty good online resource ran a, a fairly prescient piece in 2018 this six years ago by a writer called nedelko subotic it's about serbian hip-hop's turn towards extreme nationalism so in serbia it's, it's a nation that's not exactly known for its hip-hop heritage but the, the genre has been adopted by ultra conservative nationalists who have kind of fused it with hooligan chants and given it a chauvinistic edge I mean again Serbia uh, the Balkans in general but especially Serbia have some very notorious casuals groups like ultras groups that straddle all kinds of lines between organised crime simple football hooliganism street gangs and low level politics regional politics as the 90s wore on in Serbia, gangster rap inspired tales of street life overwhelmingly came to the fore and this reflected the state of the, the country as the sanctions that were on it crippled the economy, you know, civil society sort of fell apart, organised crime ran rampant. So the wave of homegrown rap also produced a kind of 12-man collective called Beogradsky Syndicate and it means Belgrade Syndicate. And after first, you know, they started out by lambasting government corruption, which is, you know, that's fair game. But they quite quickly, I think it was like their second record, they turned their attention to whomsoever they regarded as traitors, willing in their words to, quote, give up Gutsa, Kaimak and Akaya. Now, I, I don't know most of them. I think Gutsa is a, a town. Kaimak, I think, is like a food. So I can only assume that's like some ethnic food that they, they want to stop eating. Uh, and then they continue and tolerate Croats, Borka, gay parades, fuck the levies, documentarians. I'm not embarrassed of my origins. <laughs> And so they, they began kind of propagating ethnic hatred in their music. I think there's another lyric, I await your return on the bridge, but this time no Albanian shall pass. Um, another one, Marlon Brutal, <laughs> fucking name and a half, um, is a rapper whose songs include lines like, we're regarded as butchers, but we're the victims. And you ask me why I don't want into the EU. Fuck Amsterdam. I smoke skunk in the block. There I won't see gays. And by the way, that same guy, Marlon Brutal, he recently got married, dressed in traditional national garb, eating only national dishes very publicly, all to sort of mimic the arc and set to marriage. And I think it's interesting when you look at that, like because in amongst, I mean, hip hop has had a homophobic problem for a long time, but homophobia, you know, traditional family values, quote, quote, are a key part of a lot of authoritarian and nationalistic enterprises so there is definitely a, a Venn diagram crossover there that makes this a bit of a natural fit you also I mean I guess I'm sure you agree hip hop from the streets working class culture you know neo folk was the working class format back in the 70s and then into like the 80s after Tito and neo folk evolved into turbo folk trashy pop lowest common denominator pop 
it was looked down on for its working class credentials. I take on board there's a distinction though between urban and rural here. But I do think the parallels certain non-progressive ideas and the association with working class resentment, they're pretty consistent with what was initially seized upon in Turbofolk by uh, Milosevic and his group. You actually brought this up earlier on. It might seem kind of strange and maybe even hypocritical that turbo nationalists have chosen a foreign musical genre, especially one from a country that it despises in, in terms of, you know, US hip hop and rap as the vehicle for their ideology. But the writer did point out um, that having been on the receiving end of US bombs, Serbia's far right and hip hop fans kind of identify with the African American poor as fellow victims of America's imperialism. This is something you get in Russia as well. You know, there's a solidarity with the African-American purely born of the fact of the white man in America oppresses you as well. We, we, we should be allies, you know, my enemy's en- enemy is my friend. So there's a bit of that to it. And I think, unfortunately as well, what we maybe don't grasp in the West that, uh, quote, as extreme as the conservatism might appear to foreign readers within Serbian society, these views are only ever so slightly right of centre. You know, that is some of these thoughts to us may seem like, wow, they're fucking really extreme. Well, at the moment in Serbia, they aren't really extreme. They're out there, but they're not that far out there. And they're not as far out there as we might like to think they are. Um, tension in the region remains really, as, as high as it's been basically since 2001, this Macedonian conflict. And it, as I say, it's regularly fueled by propaganda interference from uh, its large northeastern neighbour. Um, and I, I, I kind of get the feeling, Mark, that like someone may end up recording a podcast similar to this one day with, with Serbian hip-hop as the subject and you know what role did it play you know how was it utilized how was it exploited to further the nationalistic ends of a similar project to Milosevic's during the 90s I think as I'm, I'm curious about your take on that though because you're you're a big hip-hop fan and you'll be aware of its strengths as well as its flaws and how easy it is to exploit quite, it's, it's been traditionally quite difficult to exploit in America right unless you're of a certain race uh, and I think that largely comes down to the fact that there is that there is that reeling against an imperialism and the fact that you've been the state is, is doing everything it can to keep you down and there still is a large part of that today. You know what I mean? Um, I mean, I think it's interesting. It was exploited by, to some extent, QAnon and anti-vaxxers because the American, the African American population, with good reason, has a lot of suspicion based on past trials of medications that were done at their expense. Uh, it's got suspicion based on general political disadvantage, you know, the, the, the state of ghettos, that the way that police brutality. There's a cynicism in the way that QAnon and anti-vaxxers and stuff were able to target those communities to further their messages. And actually quite a lot of quite prominent rap and hip-hop people like Ice Cube and stuff were fucking sharing all kinds of mad conspiratorial shit. Well, yeah, I mean, I was talking about this the other day. It's one of the things that's been really... It's a total tangent from from it's important to bring in, but it's a total tangent from the overall topic, I suppose. But one of the one of the things that the right and I guess some sections of the extreme left as well have been have done really well, perhaps knowingly, perhaps unknowingly, is, is basically politicising public health, right? Yeah, because they're two politics and public health are two completely different things. And I can talk. Uh, the reason that this comes up is I was talking to my brother about it the other day, and I was like, well. I can understand why there's a lot of people who are quite far to the left who are like, oh, I don't want to take a vaccine. That's fine, okay? I, I respect your bodily autonomy and if you don't want to do it, then I don't think you should be made to do it. I think that's fair to say that. But I think if, if you care about other people and you care about public health, then you should definitely take one, right? I think that's the thing you should do. But the people who are saying that are distrustful of the government and rightly so. I think we should always be distrustful of the government. I think, well, always be questioning of the government and their methods, right? I think we should be. But there is a line there which I think public health and politics are two different things. Mm-hmm. But the people who are falling in that trap are the ones that have distrust the government for X, Y, Z reasons, like like folk like Ice Cube, for example, who was a gangster rap guy. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And has seen his friends be shot by racist white cops and all that, and he's has deep distrust for government institutions. Yeah, sure. You know, um, so he's also a very rich man. Yeah, there is that too. But that's what I'm saying. He's falling in that trap of like public politicizing public health. I think it makes sense that. 
if somebody like you and on will be able to take an issue which they know is going to be divisive and they also know that some people still have like doubts about it like even people that are fair minded and believe in public health are still a bit like mm. still be a bit like don't understand and I mean if you don't understand your first reaction is fear you know and you want to try and understand it like it can lead some people down really extreme rabbit holes and ultimately you know? though, that fear comes from grievance right I mean well it comes from injury of some sort right but it comes from a resulting grievance and I think so all of these things are enabled mm. by grievance and when malign actors are able to sort of spot a fracture in a psyche or a communal psyche and then stick something in there and wedge it wider and wider and wider open and I feel you know in the same way as the you know the public health thing the QAnon anti-vax thing they, they were susceptible to manipulation down these channels of mm. grievance right and I think this in Serbia, this it's the same. Hip, this hip hop community, those consistent two themes of you know working class culture that feels marginalised, along with certain things, certain ideas that align with the nationalist agenda, it's vulnerable to exploitation. Still. Absolutely, yeah. and yeah. that's why I'm concerned that I don't think we'll see Turbo Folk become the vessel for it again. It's gone too far. It's yeah. too pantomime. It's, it's 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 too woke, mate. Yeah, yeah. Effectively, relatively speaking, do you know what I mean? Yeah, relatively speaking. But I do think the vessel for that messaging could well shift. It could and be something. It could be anything. I, I mean, that seems like a good candidate. Yeah, you know? it does because of its reach. <laughs> Basically what you said there was what I was going to drive directly at, you know, is that like once there is a group which like, you know, feels as though that they have distrust of the government, it just takes one or two or a particularly malign state state affiliated actor or political actor and might not necessarily be in the government to outwardly acknowledge that and then try and shove like you said the wedge in there to kind of crack get that crack to open even further because that becomes fertile ground we see it every single day and every single interaction we ever have we, we, we can come across even if you're not actually part of it if you're on it or not you come across it inevitably at some point right yeah so I think that that's probably where the only real analogy with hip hop would be is like that distrust of the state and the government because they have oppressed you know because and they have been organs for oppression Um I'd find it quite difficult why certain white men <laughs> in the Balkans would identify with people being like oppressed and treated as second class citizens. I think there's definitely a disconnect there. Yeah, poverty is poverty though. Yeah. That, is, uh, poverty is poverty. That that is that, that's the weakness of that entire racialized argument in the States where you're talking about white privilege and you have to consider that there are people in America, like millions of people that are white, that live in such completely abject poverty and they're getting shouted at for having privilege that it just, it does not resonate with them at all. And so I think poverty is poverty. I mean, if you are from the Balkans, it's all relative. And if you live yeah. in a fucking dump a ghetto then you I think are vulnerable to manipulation I, th- I just I just think I would find it quite hard to draw that parallel because that lifestyle and those lives are nothing like nothing like mine at all and anyway yeah. the only thing is poverty but the poverty that I'm experiencing I guess in Serbia is, is probably like I kind of get a job because I live in a rural town <laughs> you know what I mean it's not I kind of get a job but that's it, this this movement seems much more urban based yeah. and that is a big distinction yeah I've got one final question to finish on did you hear a single Decent bit of music. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I did find quite interesting about it, and you'll only really get this if you've listened to the whole gamut of like <laughs> Turbo Folk. God that, fucking save you if yeah, you did. <laughs> is that all that hideous ra- racist shit that we cut in and one of the earlier episodes isn't musically that different from the chord progressions and the melodies that are used in Turbo Folk now. Just better production, better players, you know, and better songwriting, but ultimately the same fundamental elements are, are still there. Yeah. Bili, 
that's the only tie you've got really to that original feeling I think is that there are still it still has that not nationalist it still has that ethnic flavour do you know what yeah. I mean that that flavour yeah, of, of that uh, style of music it know? still sounds subcultural even though it's gone into the mainstream yeah yeah mm-hmm. well I hope you actually find hang on did you listen to any good bits of music? Fuck no. <laughs> <laughs> I, no, you know what? I did actually listen to bits of music that brought a, lo- a smile to my face on a number of occasions, but it brought a smile to my face in a way that was a little bit like, I don't think this is what they intended. <laughs> but I mean, it did genuine. It was amusing. Mm-hmm. And, and there's some quite fun riffs. Tell you what, there was a lot of really fucking stinking key changes. So yeah. I'm going to have a few of them in the course of the show. Yeah, I think that that's probably a feature of that kind of that area of the world, the music in that area of the world. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. By the way, scales, progressions that are used. If you are a listener to this podcast and you got to the end of episode four, I'm going to tell you the pin number of my bank card <laughs> right now. Because <laughs> I guarantee there'll still be money in my account <laughs> <laughs> two weeks after this show goes out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right folks, thanks for coming with us on this If anybody, well, I guess if you just ever want to hold court at a bar You can now tell people about Turbo Folk and kind of blow their minds a wee bit But yeah, hopefully you've got a slightly more nuanced idea of it Than the journalist's advice And that's that's what we want Yeah, we know what we're doing next week Should we talk about it? Yeah, go for it We're going to do a digital ash and a digital learn by Bright Eyes It's not my choice Yeah, <laughs> emo. emo Fucking emo and Mark didn't pick it Which means I'm going to be outnumbered well, you don't know how I feel about Bright Eyes yet. Oh, that's true. But I do know how you feel about Emo. Yeah, Mark, pick a name at the tub. Is it Slobodan Milosevic? Because <laughs> <laughs> he was in there at one point. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we are we are open to more Nexus suggestions, so if you have made it this far, <laughs> please suggest one. Um, Ron Atley. Ron Atney? Is it my handwriting? By Davy Bright. I mean, the sad part is this is my writing, and I'm not sure what that says. <laughs> I think it says Athy. Ron Athy. <laughs> we quick, we quick phone check here to uh, give us a clue. Oh, it's uh, Ron Athey. Ron Athey, an American performance artist associated with body art. Okay, cool. Davy Bright likes a looky flex. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, cool. So it is. So bright eyes to Ron Athey. Yeah, exciting. Good work, everybody. <laughs> Let's get these glasses off. Yeah. And Bye. Get, the, get my cord on. <laughs>